Hi, this is Dr. Gregory Sadler. I'm a professor of philosophy and the president and founder of an educational consulting company called Reason.io, where we put philosophy into practice. I've studied and taught philosophy for over 20 years, and I find that many people run into difficulties reading classic philosophical texts. Sometimes it's the way things are said or how the text is structured, but the concepts themselves are not always that complicated, and that's where I come in. To help students and lifelong learners, I've been producing longer lecture videos and posting them to YouTube. Many viewers say they find them useful. What you're currently watching is part of a new series of shorter videos, each of them focused on one core concept from an important philosophical text. I hope you find it useful as well. In Gilles Deleuze's essay, Bartleby or the Formula, one of the most interesting, and indeed I'd even go so far as to say, fascinating aspects of the essay has to do with this contrast that he's making between characters and originals, which also connects with this distinction he's invoking between secondary nature and primary nature. And the implications for this go far beyond just Melville's work. In fact, he brings up Dostoevsky and other people as well. And he says that this is this is an aspect of an ancient theory, which we're going to get to shortly. Before we do that, I want to jump uh, into a remark he makes a little bit later before he's going to transition to another section, where he says, what is the biggest problem haunting Melville's oeuvre, his body of work? And he says, to recover the already sensed identity, no doubt it lies in reconciling the two originals, right? And what, what are the two originals he's talking about there? He's mentioning Billy Budd, this, this late work that has to be in some respect reconstructed. And that's a work in which he says Melville brings in two originals. There is a demonic, monomaniac being, which is Claggart, the master at arms. And then there's an angelic hypochondriac being. Uh, this is under the Melvillian you know, um, psychiatry aspect that we've talked about elsewhere. And that would be Billy Budd himself. So that's a, a story in which we don't just have one original, we have two of them. And, and you could say, well, how do you harmonize the two of them? Deleuze says that's not really what Melville is fundamentally about. He says, thereby also in rec reconciling the original, the kind of character that, that represents the original, with secondary humanity, the inhuman with the human. Now, isn't that interesting? Both of these are humanity in a certain sense, but the inhuman human and then the human human and these are going to correspond to secondary nature and primary nature. So we need to jump back in the work to where he first invokes this. And it's in the passage where he's describing um, monomaniacs like Ahab. And then he brings up Claggart. And he talks about this as metaphysical perversion. And he says, this is what the narrator suggests when he recalls an ancient and mysterious theory, an expose of which is found in Saad. So we should pause here for a second. Deleuze is not saying that de Saad is the first person to come up with this. He's saying that de Saad just manages to clarify this. By the way, the reference in this is to uh, you know, literature on Saad as well. And you can find that if you, if you get the book and look at the note uh, that he's talking about some 20th century interpretations of de Saad. But it's also there in de Saad and can be pulled out of his works. And it's also there in Melville, and it's also there in previous authors. So what is this ancient theory? He tells us secondary sensible nature. So the, the phenomenal world that we see, and it's going to include more than just the phenomenal world as we will soon see, but let's just stick with that. Phenomenal nature as we encounter it, as we experience it, that he says is governed by the law, capital L, or laws, well, innately depraved beings participate in a terrible, supersensible primary nature, original and oceanic, which knowing no law pursues its own irrational aim through them, nothingness, nothingness. 
And I want to pause here for a second to bring up something that Deleuze is not going to invoke until later. Transcendentalism, this, uh, this American movement in philosophy and literature and even in, in politics and some other things as well, is connected with this, the notion that there is um, understanding and then there's reason and that reason would be deeper. Uh, it would connect with something that exceeds just the understanding, the world of laws. That's coming to these transcendentalists through Coleridge, who is reading German idealistic philosophy, and Deleuze rightly calls attention to the interconnections and overlaps between transcendentalist philosophy, pragmatism, and Melville. So there's, there's some really interesting and rich connections to explore there. So he goes on and he says, we can classify Melville's great characters. At one pole, there's these monomaniacs or demons driven by the will to nothingness. At the other pole are angels or saintly hypochondriacs. Um, we've already talked about this in, in other places. And he says that both poles, both types of characters, Ahab and Bartleby, belong to this primary nature and they inhabit it. They, con they constitute it. Everything sets them in opposition, and yet they're perhaps the same creature. Primary, original, stubborn, seized from both sides, marked merely with a plus or minus sign, right? So they could be, and which, which gets the plus and which gets the minus. It depends on whether we're talking about agency or goodness, right? Or innocence. If we're talking about agency, it's the de demonic as opposed to the angelic, which he talks about as being petrified, frozen, unable to act and only being acted upon, being passive. If we're talking about goodness and evil, then perhaps the, the monomaniac is the evil and the angelic is the good. And a good and evil beyond the good and evil of secondary nature. And here's where we should talk about several other things that come in. He says, there exists a third type of character in Melville, the one on the side of the law, the guardian of the divine and human laws of secondary nature, the prophet. So this is very important. Divine and human laws of secondary nature. He's going to call it the representative of the law before too long. And he also points out, uh, this is a little bit earlier in the essay, that Melville thinks that psychologists can't really understand this distinction between primary and secondary nature as much as a person can understand it. And they can't apprehend what's going on in primary nature. They're stuck within the world that they know. And so this points out to us that this is not merely a phenomenal world of laws. This is also a world of sociality, customs. Humanity is understanding itself through psychological laws or regularities as opposed to merely physical laws. And, you know, this is very Kantian in a certain respect, isn't it? Kantian in the way that's going to lead to Schopenhauer uh, rather than to, to Hegel. And these prophets are representatives of the laws. And at the, at the same time, as um, Deleuze points out, there's an ambiguity here. They are able to see into the primary nature that so fascinates them. They're nonetheless representatives of secondary nature and its laws. They cannot ward off the demons. The latter are too quick for the law. Nor can they save the innocent, the irresponsible. They immolate them in the name of the law. And, and this is the part of the essay that when I first read this, oh, 25 years ago, so fascinated me, these these prophets who can actually see to some extent what's going on here and are unable to make the law really work to do what it ought to do for human beings, which would include the innocents to, to hold back the monomaniacs. And so he goes on and he says that torn between these two natures with all those contradictions, these characters are extremely important but these prophets do not have the status of the two others. They're witnesses, narrators, interpreters. And he goes on and he says, this is where we get to the, the originals versus characters. And he's, he's going to tell us after invoking the underground man, as well as Kafka and, and Musil, that um, with these two types of, of characters, uh, 
the monomaniacs and the hypochondriacs, we go beyond characters. He says, Melville introduces an essential distinction between the characters in a novel. So they're all characters, right? And he says, we must above all avoid confusing true originals with characters that are simply remarkable or singular, particular. This is because the particulars who tend to be quite populous in a novel have characteristics that determine their form, properties that make up their image. They are influenced by their milieu and by each other so that their actions and reactions are governed by general laws, though in each case they retain a particular value. The sentences they utter are their own, but governed by the general laws of language. So they may be very uh, interesting, but they, they fit into a kind of logic that applies to secondary nature. By the way, uh, Deleuze uses this term logic to include both secondary and primary nature. Logic has to be broader than just formal propositional logic. It has to genuinely become uh, an engagement with, with thought as possible. Thought is engaged with, with reality. So what are these originals then? He goes on and he tells us that, um, here we go. We do not even know if an original exists in an absolute sense apart from the primordial God. And it's already something extraordinary when we encounter one. Melville admits it's difficult to imagine how a novel might include several of them. Why? Why? Because each one, he says, is a powerful solitary figure that exceeds any explicable form. It projects flamboyant traits of expression that mark the stubbornness of a thought without image, a question without response, an extreme and non-rational logic. Figures of life and knowledge, they know something inexpressible, live something unfathomable. They have nothing general about them and are not particular. They escape knowledge, defy psychology. Now, even though they do break forth, into this secondary world where they do have a, they, they are entering into a psychology, a language, a logic, a laws, all these sorts of things. They nonetheless, they, they escape it in part because they're coming from something that was greater than it. And that this, uh, you know, world that we're used to is only, you might say the light side to invoke the old show, the dark tales from the dark side. If you don't know that reference, Google it. And it's, there's a really great intro, which begins by talking about the world that we live in, the, the sunlit world that we take for reality. And then the narrator in his very creepy voice says, but there is unknown to many of us, a dark side. And that dark side is not just the, polarity, the negative image, as the video would seem to suggest, the dark side would be the primary nature, more real, but less easy to discuss. So he says, originals are beings of primary nature, but they're inseparable from the world or from secondary nature where they exert their effect. They reveal its emptiness, the imperfection of its laws, the mediocrity of particular creatures, the world as masquerade. Prophets are the ones who can recognize the wake, Deleuze says, that originals leave in the world and the unspeakable confusion and trouble they can cause in it. So the original and primary nature cannot be systematized, cannot be brought within the realm of scientific knowledge or even, you know, metaphysics or philosophical knowledge, or we might say morality and ethics. Um, it can penetrate it to a certain degree. We can understand to a certain degree, but there's always something seemingly arbitrary about whatever is coming out of primary nature, including these originals. He's, the original says Melville is not subject to the influence of his milieu. On the contrary, he throws a vivid, a livid white light on his surroundings, much like the light that accompanies the beginning of things in Genesis. Originals are sometimes the immobile source of this light and sometimes it's dazzling passage. And so, you know, who are these originals? Well, we've already mentioned some of them. We have Ahab, we have Clogart and Billy Budd. Um, who are the prophets? Well, the attorney, Captain Vera, right? And then who are the angelic figures? Billy Budd is one. Bartleby 
is another. And all of these are ways in which primary nature is breaking forth. Now, something that we should close on and thinking about primary nature, assuming this is actually true, would then be something that would, you know, be beyond us. How is it that it's revealed in literature? Isn't literature merely an assemblage of codes of arrangements. Maybe there's something about literature that allows it to penetrate into our minds, into us, into our world of largely secondary nature and to act like a meta prophet in a certain way. Maybe that's what Melville is. Maybe that's what Deleuze is. And on that suggestion, I will just close off here and let you mull that over.